Welcome back. Thank you for complying so well with the uh, time. We're running it slightly late. Uh, Camille is going to have to uh, go shortly after her presentation. So we're going to take one or two questions just for her um, directly after her presentation so that then she can leave, but we can have a bit of a chance to discuss. And then we'll move on to Valeria. So uh, let me introduce Camille. Um, Camille Moreno is the Senior Curator of Contemporary Collections at the Centre Pompidou in Paris. Uh, she's trained as an academic in history and cur uh, curating studies. She has an expertise in modern and contemporary art and taught for 10 years in the Ecole du Louvre. Uh, she worked in other institutions in Paris, including the Musée, Musée de Art Moderne de Ville de Paris. Uh, she has an international scope as a curator uh, she has worked not only with Latin American, uh, Latin American art, but other global um, art artists. Um, from 2004 to 2006, she worked with the president of the Pompidou to create an extension of the Museum of Asia. Um, and she has special interests in women artists in the 20th century and the abstract painting uh, of Yves Klein and Gerhard Richter. Uh, so let's uh, welcome Camille. So hello everybody, I'm going to speak in English, I'm uh, French, so please excuse in advance my errors. Um, I'm not sure I completely agree with David and what he said about the relation of museums to the market. Um, I would say a, a little like a provocation that today it's better to be um, South American or anything like Argentinian or Peruvian or Chilean than French. It's um, a lot more hip, uh, there's a lot more information, and the less American collectors saying, I don't know any French artist, than American collectors saying, I don't know any South American artist. Um, so I, um, I don't completely agree with what you said about the market. I think museums can be also a place of resistance, um, of interesting thinking, um, maybe not always with shows or exhibition, but at least with the collection. Um, I, I would say then in the different personalities or, or, or uh, roles evoked right now, um, uh, we, we talked about institutions, we talked about fairs, we talked about galleries, but I think we forgot a little the artists uh, themselves and also the collectors uh, who played a very important role in the uh, institution, museums and, and the, the official narrative of, of art history. Um, and I think also one should not forget um, in museum life uh, the role of the collection compared to the show. If sometimes the show are related to the market, I think collections and the way the permanent collection are presented is very important to create, um, if not an official narrative, then a reflexive narrative in um, history of art. Uh, and that's what we've been trying to do in Centre Pompidou for the last, uh, I would say, six, seven years, trying to show the, di the collection differently, uh, to um, criticize sometimes our own attitude toward history. Uh, we've done that um, about with a, a general collection uh, thinking in relation to cinema or a moving image. We presented uh, com the complete collection, modern and contemporary collection, around that theme. Um, we did that also recently, I did it uh, with women artists. We're devoting the complete uh, two floors of the museum to only women artists. And I think that's really more resistance than falling into the market because, because clearly women artists are not or less in the market than men artists. So it was clearly an act of resistance. And that's my introduction to my talk. I don't agree um, with what you said um, of the strong relation or museum being blind to a market. We are quite aware of the pressure of the market and we're quite uh, willing to resist to it um, with whatever means we have. And the means we have clearly um, today is not the money, but the generosity of collectors who are giving works to us or artists who are making possible uh, for their work to get into the museum and also galleries. Uh, and I think today, if some galleries are clearly playing, I would say, with the market, using the market, some galleries also are resisting the market, are trying to promote artists, are living very cheaply and a difficult life in order to uh, defend their artists. And I think we should also respect that and, um, and acknowledge the fact that we work with them. Um, 
so that was another part of my introduction. Um, to collect art uh, in Centre Pompidou context, um, I think the context is very important, and Maria clearly stated how in Spain the history is uh, very uh, specific, and it's also being in Leon rather than in Madrid makes it specific. Um, in Paris, in Centre Pompidou, we have um, clearly a strong historical relation to Latin America, or what we call Amérique du Sud, because as you know, a lot of artists emigrated to Paris or to France for either artistic or political reason or a mixture of both. So we have a strong historical link uh, with different countries. Uh, some artists are still living in Paris or going back and forth. Um, and we have also uh, common movements, uh, common um, likeness, common interest, for example, conceptual art in certain type of geometrical art, in a certain type of performance, also relation to um, acting within a city or urban environment. They are very common points, artistic common points, which make it possible um, made it possible that we have now a strong collection of um, South American art, but we're still working on it. So there have been different steps in building that collection in the museum. Uh, one of them, as I said, was the presence of artists in the city or in the country. Uh, their generosity in giving their works to the museum and the generosity of their family, collectors, galleries. Uh, also a lot of exhibitions, and I will show um, uh, this a, a list of them, um, different shows, including in the, in the 50s and very regularly. And here are the few covers of the catalog, and I want to thank Dolores, who did this PowerPoint for me. Where is she? She's somewhere. Um, but as you know, this is a very historical, a long, um, a long interest for South American art, not only for the artists, but also for design and architecture, film and photography, as uh, pro you probably know, Centre Pompidou collects all these different uh, techniques. And we're moving um, forward in time, arriving to contemporary art in these, all these different, um, as I say, techniques, art architecture, art, photography, design. And moving on to the present, where we recently have uh, um, big monographies of important artists from different countries, including also movie, dance, uh, cinema, which is all of them are part of the Centre Pompidou program. So with these different steps, um, as I said, the presence of the artists, the exhibitions, and more recently also an, an increase in the knowledge about um, these different countries, a knowledge through, of course, books, uh, but also collectors, people, individuals who uh, give us tips, um, interesting information, sometimes interesting works. Um, and that's a lot uh, of how we work in museums. It's not it's not only an official narrative or like institutional work, but also a lot of personal relation to artists, galleries, collectors. And that's also something I want to stress because uh, we appear too many times as like big block institutions, but it's really a group of people um, trying to survive in a difficult environment. Um, so recently we, we took that into account and we organized ourselves a little like Tate here, Tate Modern. We decided to build groups devoted to different countries. We had for a long time an American group and we created recently a South American group of friends. Uh, as we also created recently a Japanese group of friends, a Middle Eastern group of friends, etc., etc. So we're getting organized also in like directing the generosity of collectors, artists, galleries, again, creating networks to make, to make um, the acquisition of works possible. And now, once again, I'm talking about the collection, not about the exhibition. Um, the group today of, of uh, South Latin American friends is composed as, with as many French uh, collectors as uh, South American collectors. It's a small group, but it's very active. It's also a group that gives us information about the artist. It's not, all, uh, not, not only giving money. So I will go very briefly uh, through the collection we have today. Um, it, it will be quick because I have a lot of slides to show you, but just to give you a sense of the, the quality of the collection, but also the, the, the lacks, the missing uh, works. 
a lot of this collection arrived in the museum through gifts and donation. And so we're talking about money, but once again talking about the generosity and uh, some kind of attitude toward the museum. About a third or a quarter of what you see now has not been actually bought by the museum, but given to the museum through artists, collectors, through families, because in France you can pay tax um, after the, the death of an artist by giving works, a group of works. So what you see now is, a, is an interesting collection, although a lot of names are lacking, an interesting collection that was built through the generosity of, once again, artists, collectors, gallerists, who supported the museum. So as you, as you, as you can see, it's going from um, the 40s, 50s, to the 70s with different types of work, um, photo, also architecture, and recent acquisitions. Now getting to Brazil with a long list of works, different types of works. I know I have to uh, stick into my 20 minutes, so I'll, I'll go very, <laughs> very quickly. Um, and the reason we, we build this heavy PowerPoint is because we're thinking right now about showing our permanent collection uh, in probably two years around that theme of what we call in French mondialisation, which I think you would translate into globalization or something like that. Um, it's trying to show the collection um, which is usually pretty historic work, chronological and very much European American, but show it with that um, knowledge that we have now of these um, different continents, either uh, South America, but also North Africa, Middle East, India, China. So giving, trying to give another narrative uh, for contemporary art history. So we, we're sorting out what we have and what we're missing and to build that, uh, that presentation of the permanent collection. So this, this is a recent acquisition of Ernesto Neto. Uh, we have also a very strong uh, photography collection, an interesting video and film collection. This is also, this was a gift of uh, the friends, uh, French friends of the museum. Uh, a lot of the South American gift we had in the last few years were given through um, American collectors. Um, and last year we uh, had a wonderful um, gi part, partial gift through Pinta Art Fair of Marta Minuchin, thanks to Maro here, who has been a very strong support of Centre Pompidou. And another thing to react to this uh, market museum theme, uh, which I think is still an interesting theme, but um, you have to think about the fact that in museums we're also um, fighting to, to have money and fighting against the crisis. And from a lot of the problem we have, or I have personally as a curator, is to get the right information, to get the fund to travel, for example, um, one of the problems we have is, is it's quite easy to find the money to travel in America, in New York or San Francisco, or it's more difficult maybe Los Angeles, but to find the money to go to Buenos Aires, for example, or, or it's, it's a lot more difficult. So this is a very um, important thing to also um, travel there, meet the artists, meet the galleries, meet the collectors in their own country. Five minutes. <laughs> I think I, I don't have really anything more to say even than to show you uh, what we have. Um, it's, it's an old museum. Uh, for example, this, this acquisition Frida Kahlo was made very early. I think right after the surrealist show in Paris in 1936. This is the only, um, I think, European work of Frida Kahlo in the public museum. Uh, I have to say, for once, we've been good and efficient in Paris. It's not the case for a lot of the artists that we didn't buy right on time and now they're too expensive. But in that case, we're lucky and, and pretty good. Yes.
finish speaking is this on yes um would you um should we open it uh, to the floor for questions uh, are you happy yes if, if, if I'm, I'm ready to answer a question I'll, I'll still let this image go on so you can okay. see okay um are there any questions <laughs> or responses from the audience to Camille's talk <laughs> um, Camille, I just wanted to ask you about the uh, geographical focus or not of um, the Pompidou's collecting from South America. What do you mean by geographical focus? What I mean focus? is, um, well, in your presentation you're showing them by country mm -hmm. and I just wondered whether you do have an aim to collect from countries throughout the region or it's, that's not a criteria. Um, it's the way to organize things for a PowerPoint. Um, then uh, it doesn't really work that way. Uh, we organize th this uh, South American, American uh, group of friends is, is recent and so we've, we've planned different um, traveling or meeting places. So we certainly will try to go to, once to Brazil, once to Argentina, etc. But we don't have specific groups of geographical. Uh, I know it's, it sounds uh, sometimes politically incorrect to even today to talk about uh, a specificity of Latin American art or South American art, but it's also a way for institution to think about budget to find, to raise funds. Uh, it's as stupid as that. Uh, um, and, and then um, also not so much to create families or, or as you say, David, uh, work that are we're going to meet a group or create a new group. But it's, it's also a way, an interesting way to think. Um, but I agree with you that sometimes you have to also react against that. Um, this is an interesting list of um, work that got into the collection lately of that continent of um, uh, South America. Uh, there's about, um, for 2010, around 20 works that got into the collection. As you can see, out of these 20 works, uh, a fourth, I think, were actually uh, acquisitions. Uh, the um, three-fourths uh, of them were gifts of partial gifts or things that were given either by collectors of artists or um, so once again, a museum really lives through the generosity of either people in the country or people outside the country, but it's really a public institution that is alive thanks to other people. It doesn't, it's not supported by itself in a way. It needs the generosity of other people. And that's very clear once in, you get into the museum and that makes also the museum a good place for resistance against the market because of that, because it's not only money spent. It's a lot of generous gestures. Okay, I think we have a response from David. <laughs> Camille, I, is this on? Yes. I just wanted to say I don't think there is as much disagreement between us as you imagine. <laughs> okay. um, I had to speak quickly. And I know. it is plainly true that... <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, there is resistance mm -hmm. amongst curators. I mean, there are people like yourself, no doubt, who are making every effort to counteract the influence, the massive influence of the market. And obviously you're right, I know full well because I've, I spent nearly 20 years raising money for museum acquisitions. Money is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, I mean, in a sense, it's a matter of political will whether money should be spent on continuing to acquire works which are already uh, richly represented in mm -hmm. public collections or rather is spent on developing collections in new areas. And although it's great to be able to rely on so many gifts, um, there is no substitute for an active purchasing policy. Absolutely. Um, I agree with that. And the development of those mm -hmm. close collaborative relations with artists, with dealers, mm -hmm. with critics and others in the, if you like, the source countries is really, really important. Money is needed for that too. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think we agree. It's just that uh, I would tend to emphasize the, the dark side and you are understandably yes, emphasizing the light. <laughs> Thank you. I'm afraid we're going to have to draw this mm -hmm. uh, to a close now. Thank you very much, Camille.
I'd like to introduce uh, Valeria Paz. Uh, she's an in independent curator from Bolivia, uh, and she's a researcher. She was the head of the museum department uh, at the National Museum of Art in La Paz from 2007 to 2010. Uh, between 2003 and 2007, she worked as the curator of exhibitions at the same museum. Uh, she's undertaken extensive research in uh, Bolivian contemporary art uh, and has worked as an independent curator in La Paz. She's studying now for a PhD at the University of Essex uh, and she's researching art as a potential emancipatory tool uh, in the work of Roberto Valcarcel. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Joanne, for inviting me, and thank you, Miriam, as well. Um, in my talk, um, I'm going to speak as a former curator of the, Museum National, of the National Museum of Art in La Paz, as uh, I'm also including uh, some issues as researcher, and some issues that I'm interested in now, and um, also some issues of interest uh, uh, regarding the current situation and in Bolivia, and I'm going to uh, talk about uh, ideology, maybe as, a, as maybe one of the challenges that we face. Uh, certainly, market is not a big challenge in, uh, for the arts in Bolivia, but the challenge that we face is, uh, I think, uh, having to comply with this, uh, with the current ideology. But I think uh, I'm interested in um, thinking how uh, it could be possible to deal with this because there's, I, I believe there's always ideologies present in collecting, and I think also I agree with the uh, previous speakers that uh, collecting is also related with curating and interpretation. So um, I will start now, and I will read, just because uh, there's so many things <laughs> I would like to tell you, and also I'm quite aware that probably most of you don't know much about what's going on with art in Bolivia or the National Museum of Art in Bolivia. One could say that the current change of vision towards politics and culture promoted by the new Bolivian state with its decolonizing agenda means that the National Museum of Art of Bolivia is against the international current of globalization in arts. This is particularly apparent when compared to such visible Latin American countries as Brazil and Mexico. The vision of Mexican artist Gabriel Orozco exemplifies such trend. In his recent exhibition at the Tate Modern, Orozco's work was claimed to belong to an age in which people, images, and commodities are no longer rooted in a single geographic location, but are continually, continuously, continually on the move. The artist himself is equally at home in Mexico, New York, Paris, and regularly makes a, and exhibits works all around the world. The collecting and curatorial strategy of the National Museum of Art in La Paz counteracts such vision. In my presentation today, I will address ideological decolonizing as the main challenge faced today for collecting and curating in the National Museum of Art, La Paz. Decolonizing is a term employed to describe the prevalence of a Western European ethos in the government administration and as consequence, redressing the lack of real representation of the indigenous people and their cultures in the state. Collecting and curating in the National Museum cannot be separated from this political context and ideology. I will finish by proposing some curatorial strategies which could potentially overcome the limitations of being inseparable from a political ideological program. program. I believe that both the current collections in the museum and also its future acquisitions cannot be addressed without a new permanent exhibition project. Sorry, sorry. The National Museum of Art hosts the largest and most comprehensive collection of Bolivian art in the country, covering a time span from the 16th to the 20th century. Created in 1960, the National Museum of Art is a young institution, which until only very, re very recently has been granted a budget to finance what nowadays are standard museum practices, such as curating, conservation, research, and collecting. 
The new economic autonomy of the museum is a result of its incorporation at the end of 2003 into the Central Bank of Bolivia Cultural Foundation. This is a public institution that was created to promote and administer the most important repositories of art, heritage, and documentation of the country, such, such as the National Archive and the Muse Museum of the Casa de la Moneda in Potosí. The National Museum of Art, as a government institution, currently faces the challenge of transforming its space, collections, and exhibition halls in line with the political agenda of President Evo Morales, the first elected indigenous head of state of Bolivia. Cultural plurality is the principle behind the new, state, the new state's ideology, and the National Museum must therefore represent and serve this agenda. A compelling sign of the government's new vision is clearly expressed in the change of the name of, of the country in 2008. The name Republic of Bolivia, because of its links with Western ideas of enlightenment, was replaced in 2008 with the, the name Plurinational State of Bolivia. So now we have a new name, and this is the perfect symbol for this change. While redressing the overstatement of Western ideas in museum practices is an exciting challenge, it is a complex tax task which entails many theoretical and practical difficulties and contradictions. For example, how to think of a new epistem of art, which is specifically local or connected to the indigenous in Bolivia, for a collection housed and displayed in an 18th century building associated with criollo, which means Spanish born in the Americas, with Criollo power and legacies? The existing curatorial narrative of the museum, so I, I just want to clarify that now um, there, there's a um, there, there's a project, but what I'm going to talk about is what I'm proposing. It doesn't exist yet, so I'm going to take as reference what uh, what was happening until 2010 when I came to the UK. The existing curatorial narrative of the museum, which I worked as a curator, was a first attempt to show what at the time seemed like a recurrent question in Bolivian art, the quest for a national identity. While addressing a collection from a national discourse seems conservative from the point of view of the museum's current project, it provided an overview of Bolivian art, which was previously in, excess, in, in existence, in existent, and which made sense at the time within the specificity of the Bolivian context, particularly its highly unstable recent political history and the lack of research and information of its own art history. Um, I'm going to talk now about um, the current project. It's just an idea of what uh, currently is being proposed by the museum. And, uh, but it has a theoretical basis, and I'm going to talk to you about this now. It's, uh, it's called uh, artistic nomadism. In the museum, they call it uh, um, decolonizing. Or, you know, the current collecting and curatorial project of the museum seeks to highlight art and artists who work with the different cultures of Bolivia. An example brought in by the current director is indigenous artist Roberto Mamani Mamani, who takes part in both the Western Criollo world of local galleries and museums, where he shows his paintings, and who also dances in Gran Poder Festi Festival, a religious celebration associated with the indigenous sector of the city of La Paz. While to outsiders the Grand Poder celebration will seem to be a mere folkloric festivity with roots in Catholicism, this ritual has a latent indigenous quality. It can be considered an updated version of the Taki Onkoi, a 16th century rapturous dance to pre-Columbian gods, which represented a rejection of the Catholic religion enforced by the Spanish colonizers. And while today it is both a Catholic and indigenous celebration, it has both local and global economic ties. Its dancers import the li latest trends in fabrics for their, for their costumes from Asia every year, 
and it is the largest cultural event in La Paz in terms of economics. But this, it is not only the painter Mamani Mamani who moves between the Western and Aymara indigenous worlds. Members of the Grand Poder, um, sorry, members of the Grand Poder indigenous community also consume and commission art in a peculiar way, which would have interested Walter Benjamin. Mamani Mamani has been asked to paint the shows of a group of women dancers who have agreed to pay for them the same price he charges for his paintings. While the Western European Museum tradition tends to convert art into aesthetic objects of comp don comp contemplation, current indigenous commissions of Western painting have removed the aura of paintings by transfor transforming them into functional devices. Now I'm going to talk uh, about a couple of examples from the works that are currently in the collection. I'm going to uh, try to explain how uh, they could be included, in fact, in this ideological proposal and project, complemented, of course, by my, by my ideas. Revising the interpretation of examples of works of the collection might contribute to complement the decolonized project. For example, the 18th century Virgin Mountain, acquired by the National Museum of Art in 1992, is a painting set in the Potosi Mountain, whose silver founded, funded the Spanish economy during the colony. It is an image from which nomadic, the nomadic and, contradict nomadic and contradictory interpretations could be extracted, depending on the viewer's point of view. As the Mamani Mamani, Gran Poder Scholes, it is an image that inhabits the colonial Spanish world and the, indigen and the indigenous one. The Virgin Mountain evidences the existence of a twofold religious cult. The Virgin incorporated into the mountain is a representation of the Pachamama, the indigenous goddess of the earth. Recognized as such, the painting can be used as a devotional object to do two different divine characters, the Catholic Virgin and the Andean Earth Goddess. But the Virgin Mountain has also a dichotomous political dimension. From the European point of view, the painting may be read as evidence of the supremacy of Western values and allegiance to the Spanish crown, as evidenced in the representation of the royal and religious authorities of the time and the plus ultra columns of the Hab Habsburgs. From the local point of view, However, the centrality of the Pachamama and the city of Potosí in the composition marks a national identity with roots in the Americas and in the indigenous legacy. It could be argued that the inscription of the history of the discovery of silver on the body of the Virgin establishes a relation between the criollo donors of the painting and the royal Inca dynasty. Another example currently exhibited in the National Museum of Art, which would require a double interpretation, is the 1979 Cordillera, or mountain range by Maria Luisa Pacheco. From one point of view, this image may be interpreted as a continuation of the representation throughout the history of Bolivian art of the Pachamama or Mother Earth Goddess. This reading would be supported by the, by the ideological context of the painting, the legacy of the 20th century indigenous movement led by, led by painter Cecilio Guzman de Rojas, an attempt to launch a local avant-garde movement as Joaquin Torres Garcia constructed un universalism from within the specificity of the place and in this case of the indigenous cultural legacy. From what may appear to be an opposite point of view, Pacheco's work also reflects the artist's position as part of a group who refused to support the political ends of the National Revolution Movement Party in the 50s. Hence, Cordillera, acquired by the museum, brings about another dimension to the problem of cultural identities. It represents the possibility of making and exhibiting art beyond government ideology. Now I'm going to talk about um, one work of art as an example of what could also be acquired by the museum. Um, 
The new nomadic narrative proposed by the National Museum of Art may also benefit with the acquisition of works of art which undermine the risk of a, of a one-dimensional project. One example is the Escalinated Cross, a 1994 conceptual piece by Roberto Valcarcel, the image in the middle. This, Im this work was submitted to a private gallery for inclusion into a group exhibition with a theme which, uh, with, with the theme was, whose theme was uh, celebrating indigenous culture. The organizers of the show decided not to include the work and returned it to the artist, claiming that it did not represent the concept of the exhibition. Describing the work as unsuitable is of course an understatement for an artwork set to question the event as, as is illustrated in the following extract originally in Spanish, which is part of the work. It says, the members of the Spanish-speaking criollo minority have the same right to be proud of who they are, as all and each one of the other ethnic groups and cultures with, which constitute this country. We do not deny the possibility of a symbiosis or, or mestizaje between the different cultures, but we believe that this must have real foundations economic and productive, not merely mimetic accommodating bases or others derived from cultural opportunism. We do not wish to disguise ourselves as autochthonous and assume mystical or ideological positions which can only tarnish one of the main principles of art of all groups and cultures, honesty. This piece might seem like a critical statement of what is at stake in the plurinational discourse the exclusion of a new type of alterity, Bolivia's Western heritage. But from another point of view, it is also an institutional critique of artistic trends, cultural institutions, and government policies. This work is certainly not about excluding indigenous motifs in art, as, ev as, evidenced, as evidenced in the following e in the examples on the top left and bottom right where Roberto Valcarcel depicted um, an intergalactic uh, pre-Columbian gate of the sun. And also in this work of art, which was about the contribution of the South American potato to the Western civilization. Viewed in these terms, view, viewed in terms of the context, the work of Roberto Valcarcel may be interpreted as a work about the importance of maintaining the possibility of not following prescribed paradigms of art. As you can see, the curatorial narrative of the National Museum of Art in Bolivia has a clear, although often implicit, agenda, specific to its regional and political context. All collection acquisitions policies are constructed within ideological contexts which define their ends and influence the works displayed and viewed by audiences of the museum. However, many lessons might be derived from the, artwor from the artworks that I have shown today. When complying with such particular collections programs, both in the local and global context, the museum must also provide a space not only for cultural diversity, but for debate and self-questioning, assuming we are still interested in keeping art and cultural institutions as essential spaces of freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valeria. I'd like to invite uh, Maria Inez and David to take the stage again, and uh, then we'll open for questions. <laughs> 